Good afternoon, everyone. The International Parking Mobility Institute presents today's shop talk for airports, COVID-19, and our industry's response. My name is Justin, and I'll be assisting Dave Wilson Cap and Dean Hamid in moderating today's shop talk. As a reminder, today's shop talks are being recorded. We will make the recordings available online within 48 hours for us to share. Um, before we start, Sean Conrad, IPMI's CEO, would like to say a few words. Thanks, Justin. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing well, especially under these circumstances. Certainly, this is not business normal, is it? We have a, a lot of different things going on, but I think as far as the playbook goes, it's been thrown out and we're, uh, we're going day by day especially from the standpoint of these shop talks, they give us a great opportunity to share information, to see what others are doing, see, uh, see what's working, what's not working. So I appreciate all the folks that are on this. Actually, it does my heart good to see so many people participating in these shop talks. The bottom line is that you're not in it alone, that we are in this together. We have a great community. And I appreciate David and Dean's help with this shop talk discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, again, thank you for everyone joining us today. Um, just want to give a go over a couple of uh, housekeeping items before we start. Um, if you have a webcam and you're comfortable doing so, please turn on your camera. IPMI wants to, uh, everyone to feel engaged and participate. And we want to see your smiling faces. We want to make this virtual shop talk just like a regular shop talk, face-to-face -face and sharing our ideas. As a reminder, all participant lines are muted. We invite everyone to participate. Um, to do so, we ask that everyone please use the raise your hand feature. Online participants, please um, raise your hand by clicking the raise your hand function button on the participant menu. To open access to the raise your hand button, Please open the participant menu. It will be on the, the window will open up on the right side of your screen and the raise your hand button will be at the bottom of the participant list. Phone participants, you can press star nine to raise your hands. Once recognized, your phone will be unmuted and allowed to join the conversation. Please state your name and the organization that you work for before commenting. You may also type your question into the chat. Click the chat icon and type your question or comment and click send. I will read it then to the group. I will repeat these instructions throughout the program. Um, before we get started, I wanted to prompt everyone with a few questions. We want to know, how is your operation mitigating this crisis situation? What has your experience uh, been firsthand in dealing with the situation? And who are your essential staff? Now I'm going to turn the audience over to Dave Wilson and Dean Amid. Hey, thanks, Justin. Um, I just uh, I want to say thank you again to everybody um, um, with IPMI for giving us this opportunity. It's a real honor uh, for Dave and I to come on and, and have an opportunity to talk to everybody and really uh, to get everybody's feedback and to hear what everybody else is going through. I'm sure everything's pretty similar, but um, so I just wanted to start out with um, uh, just some of the the statistics of what we're seeing today um, at DFW Airport, um, and I'm curious to see how this how others are affected also. And uh, and then after that, Dave will Dave Wilson will um, start uh, with the questions Justin just outlined. Um, so first of all, here at DFW, we are um, down about 70% in our concessions. We're down 80% in our parking transactions. Um, our flights, um, we have about 1,800 flights a day. We are only, we are down to about 500 a day. Um, and those flights are only 20% occupied. The load factors are only 20%. So, um, you know, when, when uh, I was on a flight a couple weeks ago, I think there were 10 people on the flight. And so it's, it is, it's barren out there. Another statistic also is our TSA partners. They've told us that you know, a normal day on you know, average is about 62, 65,000 people come through the checkpoint. We're at about 5,200 right now. Um, so it's down significantly, and I'm sure everybody else has the same types of uh, 
numbers. In addition to that, um, taxis, as we know, uh, because of uh, everything else that's been going on in the market prior to the COVID-19, taxis are down to seven a day, seven dispatches a day here at DFW. Um, and some of the things that we've done to mitigate some of this is we've take some, taken some of our buses, we've moved them to different facilities. For example, we put them in our employee lot so we could uh, use it for that because of the six feet rule. They wouldn't have too many people in the buses and, and so on. So we're doing a lot of things to mitigate those um, those factors. But at this point, I want to turn it over to Dave and, uh, to start uh, with some of the questions. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dave Wilson. I'm the uh, transportation business manager for DFW Airport. Uh, and I'm glad to, can't see everybody because it only shows me three people at once, but I really enjoy it when we are able to meet at IPMI and hopefully I've met you at a conference. Anyway, the first question I have is just, uh, have any of you experienced an actual case of one of your staff having COVID or having been exposed to COVID? And if so, how did you handle it? Okay, so can you hear me? Yeah, Lily. Yes. Hey, this is Liliana. How are you all doing? Good. Um, unfortunately, yes, uh, for the Houston Airport Systems. Um, we actually found out yesterday that one of our Airport Operations Center um, personnel is positive and it went bad pretty quickly. Um, the person right now is in emergency room, um, very critical condition. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it really has hit more than home right now. Uh, this is a person that you work with um, on a daily basis. And uh, the airport operations center is, a, is an area where you have a lot of people that go in and out of there. So, um, you can imagine what that did to our that operation. Um, you have to get you have to get everybody out of there. Um, have them now quarantine. They're going today and they're getting uh, tested today. Um, and then the the cleaning that we had to do yesterday, um, the amount of notice that we had to send out to our business partners, um, HPD, TSA, the airlines, the concessions because there are a lot of people that go through there. Um, that being said also, that employee, the fact that he tested positive is, is, is in critical condition right now, but also is trying to understand who did he come in contact with. And this is something, you know, trying to get a list of the amount of people that he had been in contact with here at the, at the, at the airport. So it's really, I'm, I'm, st I'm still trying to get over it. We, we have been dealing with this, um, yesterday afternoon and this morning. So um, it, it's, it's still very new. So how are you um, operating? Did you move the airport operations center? Or? So what we had to do is, uh, thankfully for us, we have um, agents from Landsite that have been trained to um, be able to be airport operations center um, operators. So, bring some of those um, agents in so um, we the third shift we basically are transferring all the calls and we basically transfer the operating center over to Bush the, the larger airport but we have that ability because we do have three airports within our system two of which have an airport operation center okay Chrissy Chrissy, if you want to uh, speak, we can unmute you. You're in. Her name came up, so I didn't know. Yeah. All right. I would just say let's let's move on to the next question. If Chrissy, if you want to join in, uh, please don't hesitate to type your comment in the chat or uh, raise your hand, and we will call on you. Okay, and Liliana, thank you. That that was very enlightening, and uh, 
uh, we'll be keeping that person in our prayers. Um, what that well, like kind of leads to our next thing is what elements of your operation do you consider to be essential functions? And then how do you, uh, how would you handle a situation like Liliana's where the whole facility went, became uh, an area that you had to, to quarantine? Anybody I'm going to speak on that again, David. Yeah. yeah. So um, basically, um, for us at the, here at the Houston Airport System, um, two weeks ago, right, when the mayor was saying, well, all essential employees, um, you know, get to telecommute and, uh, I mean, non-essential get to telecommute and essential employees get to telecommute. Um, you know, it's one of those things that sometimes you want to be essential and there are some times that you don't want to be essential. <laughs> and probably this was one of the ones that most of us wanted to be non-essential. Um, unfortunately for the airport, I think for most of our airports, um, about 80% uh, of, the, of the airport staff is essential um, for us here at the Houston Airport System. So, um, um, you know, we, we were able to go, again, being a, a municipality, um, we have to do pretty much what all the other departments do. Uh, we're still um, a part of the city of Houston. So we had to wait for all those regulations to come out. Uh, once they came out, we were able to figure out who is essential. And this is not the same essential as the tier one when there is a, a weather event, this is very different. Uh, but who is essential to be here um, for the airport to keep on, on, on moving? You know, one of the things that was hard to grasp is even though, you know, to your same point, we don't have the, you know, thousands of employees coming, um, thousands of passengers that travel the airport day in and day out. But even if you have two or three or five or 10, you still have airplanes that are, that are you know, landing on your airfield. You, feel, you still have passengers that have to get through TSA. Um, if you're still receiving international passengers, you have to have CVP available. So you still got to ba have bathrooms that you got to clean. So um, it, it was trying to figure out how to, how to expose the least amount of people um, to the public and to each other and in the social distancing. So, um, you know, basically everybody that's operations, we had to make the decision that those people were, were essential. What we were trying to do is change their, their hours. Uh, we have to change a lot of the stuff that we're doing, um, is, is for example, the briefings, um, because of the social distancing and we wanna make sure that everybody is apart from each other. Instead of doing the briefings, you know, 20 people at a time, we're doing it 10 people at a time at different times in different, in different areas. Um, you know, one practice that we have here at the airports or cities overall is you carpool a lot from one airport to the next or from meetings to meetings. Well, we have um, rushing them down to only two people being able to carpool, one in the front, one in the back. Um, you know, our meetings are pretty much like this right now, <laughs> instead of person to persons, which was very difficult and different for us. Um, so, you know, again, um, the essential employees were, were basically everybody that's, that's, that's in operations. I mean, your custodial, your um, customer service. Some, we have some, we don't have all of the customer service people here. Your maintenance staff, uh, grant transportation, we were able to diminish because the same thing the Dean said, we have a lot less need for them, but we still, you need people here at the airport. You just cannot shut, unless you decide that you're gonna shut the doors down and nothing is gonna come in, you still need people here, so. Yeah, the, the, you're right with an airport, it's very challenging because uh, almost all of your frontline employees are in, essential. You can reduce some, but Correct. you gotta have those functions done. And so, uh, you know, it, it was challenging for everybody. So thank you very much. And uh, Stephanie, since Seattle was one of the first ones hit, did y'all go through that exercise real, real quickly about seeing where you could call down and you know what you had to have and didn't have to have was she on classified as essential but they still want as many people as possible to um not be in the airport uh you know as as they can um uh, it's the same issue that Liliana has with, you know, the essential personnel and um, operations and facilities and, um, 
you know, maintenance, all of those still need to be um, on site, but we're also staggering our shifts again uh, and doing smaller numbers of people. So I believe we're down to about a third of what our regular staffing is for each shift. Um, I have um, but, you know, from the parking perspective, you know, we're down to one cashier lane. Um, we're trying to minimize all the interactions with our customers, um, but we're I mean, I was at the airport yesterday getting a few things, and it's it's empty. I mean, we usually have between 50 and 60,000 people going through a day, and we had a less than 5,000 um, yesterday. So um, it's bad. Yeah. So have, has anybody had to actually uh, let people go or cut hours? We haven't we haven't uh, um, addressed that yet. Uh, right now, we're working on cutting all of our budgets. Uh, you know, we're trying to cut anywhere we can, uh, just in expense budgets and project budgets, defer uh, projects if we can. Uh, I think the last line of defense is for us to furlough or um, lay off employees. Yeah, I think. Well, here our CEO came out early and said and then reiterated that in the town hall today that like you said that cutting airport staff would be the last line however we had we were very heavy with uh, temporary staff on the front lines so we did a let a majority of our temporary staff go especially the curbside management and some of the parking people uh, the operations people uh, and like I said, we're, so we're not manning as many cashier lanes. And uh, so, any, does anybody else have have an experience where you've had to let people go, or it looks like you may have to? No, we. I think I, you know, all, all of our budgets, especially airports, have been are, are being hit, you know, extremely hard. Um, you know, everywhere you look at it, right? If uh, airlines are not flying in, there are no passengers. You know, you you have your um, Revenues and non ironical revenues also being affected, but uh, we talked, about but we we have not made a decision. I think at this point in time, we're holding hard line of you know we're not going to let employees go or or furlough or if if we can, um, you know the one thing that we were waiting for and that we were very grateful was the the bill that was passed for the aid that is coming into the aviation industry. And, you know, the amount of money that is coming, depending on the airport that you're at, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a substantial amount of money. It's not just for the airports, but it's also for the airlines. Um, for us, for the Houston airport system, we were actually looking and see how we could help the airlines. Because uh, if you don't have airlines, you don't have airports. So that is, that is a symbiotic uh, relationship there. So um, we were actually trying to see how we could help the airlines. We have, a, thank God, we have a pretty healthy uh, revenue stream and, and we have um, good um, research, uh, but being and looking at what uh, we have taken a look at the bill and the amount of money that is coming towards us, we don't think that we're going to have to make any any furloughs or we, we don't think that we're going to have to do any layoffs. Uh, we just need to get that money here quickly and in a hurry so that we can uh, go ahead and put it into our into our budget and our and our coffers. Sounds yeah. like, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dean. No, I was going to say, Liliana, that's, um, you know, that $10 billion, I don't, we don't know exactly how much we're getting either, but that really turned the tide. We we were thinking that maybe by, we can make the commitment till the end of, um, you know, May or June. Um, and then once this bill passed, uh, we've made the commitment that we're not going to lay anybody off. Um, as Dave said, we, we do have quite a bit of temporary help here. Um, and we've had to move, move a lot of those around. Um, thankfully, we don't have to we don't have to, um, you know, decrease a lot of them, but um, so we, we see our our temp staff really as as our partners and as as our regular employees also. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, one of the things that I know Dave may get to this question, but um, our we've had to look at the different lots that we had and and we have we had to shut down different facilities, and so uh, we can get to that a little bit later. But um, I'd love to hear from everybody else what. Uh, what they've thought about, any ideas on, on the, you know, making their 
operation more efficient, making it smaller, or uh, or something that would like. And remember, if you want to uh, participate, if you click on the manage participant option, there's the raise your hand feature. You can go ahead and raise your hand and we'll call on you next. Well, I'm going to bounce off of Dean's. Oh, did somebody have a comment? No, I'm going to bounce off of Dean's statement and ask, has anybody, uh, you know, like Dean said, we've shut down three lots reducing bus service so that reduces contacts, moving more people to the terminals because obviously we have terminal parking available. Um, has anyone else taken measures like that to reduce either, either closed lots? I heard some airports may have closed some terminals. What, what other uh, mitigating things have you done to kind of reduce cost and reduce contact points? So, uh, I mean, I will speak for, for Houston. Uh, for To reduce contact points, we, we actually are using the, the terminal parking. So uh, we have uh, reduced drastically the, what we're charging for terminal parking. Uh, we can't give out free terminal parking. So we, we have um, offered a very, 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 very uh, discounted to the employees. Um, a lot of our employees, especially TSA, uh, the airlines employees, they shuttle to the terminal and uh, because we wanted to reduce that exposure, we went ahead and we're allowing them to park at the, at the terminal parking, which is empty right now. Um, we have not reduced any of our services at this point in time. We, we, uh, we have not done that. One of the things that our executive director, um, you know, talking to him and the senior staff, you know, he really understands and, and he's, he's committed to keeping everybody employed as much as we can. Um, in Houston, we, we are a huge employer, not just, you know, not just the airlines, but, you know, we have a lot of um, um, construction programs going on and shutting those programs down or, or, or you know, canceling them at some point or another, that's going to have even a worse effect on everything that is going here in the economy. So um, our mayor has um, allowed us to keep everything pretty much going. Um, because again, it's the, the really hard times. So as much as we can, and, and um, we were hoping and we were praying that the money from the federal government will come through. Um, I mean, and we know that it's, we kind of sort of know how much we're gonna get because it's based on your 2018 employment. So we have done uh, the, the financing of that and we kind of sort of know, at least from one pot of money, how much we're gonna get. And if we get that here pretty quickly, we should be able to keep uh, business as usual until um, the airlines um, start, you know, back on business. Um, it's really very disheartening to take a look at Bush Airport and see over 100 planes just parked. It, it, that just, that just uh, it, it, it's a very, very unsettling feeling. Or looking in the sky going to work and only seeing one plane if you see that many. But to me, that's a hard drive in to work. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. so. yeah Steph. Uh, we ourselves, um, we only have one main garage. It's about a little over 12,000 stalls. Uh, and then we also have employee lots. Uh, we have a North employee parking lot. And so um, as of the 20, well, early last, early last week, we um, moved all of our um, airport employees into our garage because we had occupancy. Uh, and we had issues with bus overcrowding, uh, with uh, complaints from airlines and other airport uh, staff, uh, not having the six foot uh, rule or um, just having too many people on the buses and feeling um, concerned about that. So we did um, reprogram about 12,000 of our North employee lot cards into our garage and we'll be doing a 30 day um, free parking in the garage uh, for those employees. Uh, until such time we may extend it. Um, they still are paying their, their North employee lot, which is cost recovery. It's a little less than $80 a month, but um, we see them in there um, for at least the next 30 days uh, for us. Our overnight inventory, you know, like I said, it's a 12,000 stall garage. Um, last night, our overall inventory, over, I'm sorry, the overnight inventory was uh, less than 1,500 uh, vehicles. And we're in the process of moving the employees in also for the same reasons you mentioned. 
and you know the space is there. So, um, uh, how are the smaller airports? Are you moving around employees, or anybody from a smaller airport want to address the issue? Go ahead, Mike. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. I'm I'm just I'm 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 audio on the phone. My laptop, the uh, camera is not supported, so sorry for the. I don't know who we're going to look at while I talk, but uh, so um, we are also, you know, our occupancy levels. Like I just heard what Steph mentioned. We're at about three percent full. So usually we have, you know, three thousand vehicles on average there every night. Um, right now we only have one hundred. As far as our flights. Um, Things have gone down drastically. You know, we only have like a handful of flights in and out every day. Um, all of the tenants inside of the terminal have began to lay off all their employees. So none of the gift shops or um, food services, I'm not sure about the rental cars, but um, the gift shops and food services, there, there's no one working right now. Um, as far as the the actual airport staffing. So um, the parking at the airport is we have, we're self-operated. So we're all Dane County employees. Sorry, I'm Mike Maramati, Madison, Wisconsin. I, I guess I should have uh, started off with that airport in Madison. Um, we have every department and every division at the airport has initiated a reduced staffing model where because of the little activity that we have, we are scheduling so that we have the least amount of social interactions with each other as possible. So we're going from having, you know, six people on per day to only three, just like a skeleton crew, one person there at a time, um, because there's really nothing happening. We're basically just security guards at this point. So as you can imagine, there's not enough hours to go around, but we are fortunate enough to have the budgetary capability to continue paying people and making them whole and what they otherwise would not or would be working. Um, so people are still getting paid their full amounts, but they're just going to be working a reduced amount of hours. Um, you know, I, I found myself scrambling to try to have access, remote access to various systems and kind of going through challenges with that, um, as well as, you know, our physical operations having to have signage and and, and um, directing people to only use these self-service lanes. Like we have somebody sitting in a booth, but we've essentially have the lane closed and a cone in front of it and are forcing customers to, not forcing, but, you know, strongly encouraging customers to use the self-service lane, press the assistance button if you need help. And then we will try to make it a an intercom remote type of interaction opposed to actually helping people face-to-face um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, it's required a lot of kind of scrambling each day, seeing, you know, the different things that come out and trying to make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're still trying to do our jobs. Um, oh, and one thing that hasn't been brought up either, um, at least for a small airport is maintenance. And so we are responsible for all the cleaning and sanitization. So we have been given, um, it's almost like a power tool sprayer that we can go around and like spray the various elevate, the various elevators and handrails and all the um, everything that people touch, all the frequently touched objects and uh, are able to actually disinfect things very quickly because we have the necessary tools uh, to do so. So, um, you know, everything's changing every day, just like for everybody else. But um, that's pretty much how things are going in Madison. Okay. And Roop, I'm going to mispronounce your name. Roop Johal, I see that you made a comment. Do you want to speak to that and what y'all did there at TPDA, at TPA? Yeah, so um, hopefully you can hear me guys, but I'm um, pretty much in line with kind of what a lot of people have said. We re relocated uh, all of our employees, our HCAA employees, we moved to a, a close ring garage, one above the terminal. All the employees that were in a remote lot, we relocated into a long-term garage, which is, which is a short walk away, it's across a bridge. And again, we did that purely for um, social distancing. We're doing as much maintenance as, and as restriping and everything as possible. You know, our maintenance guys are out there. We have, haven't done anything with staffing yet. 
um, it's really it's being assessed on a, on a daily basis right um, the relocation of employees has kind of taken up a, a whole bunch of staffing on entry lanes and, and exit lanes and whatever else in, in two different lots so we'll be in review mode for that this week we'll be looking to make some cuts probably in the the less skilled kind of sector because they'll be easier to replace right but um you know, we'll, we'll keep the core team in place. We're not looking at making huge reductions. As far as garage closures are concerned, we've got a 12,000 space uh, economy garage, which is linked by a train. We'll be looking at closing half of that. There's, you know, our occupancies, like you guys are saying, are pretty much dead. We're in a, you know, we're, we're in a bad way, just like everybody else. You know, we're kind of like, I think we're running at around about 5% or so of what we would, we were making last year at the moment, between 5 and 10%. So, so not a lot. Uh, a rate increase, which we had scheduled for April 8th, has been deferred by at least 90 days. We'll see what happens there. But um, yeah, generally, you know, we're reacting at the moment. We're trying to put a plan in place now that we're a little bit more steady. You know, we know what we're doing with the employees. We're in a better position. Um, but yeah, not, not happy days. So, um, yeah, one of the... Uh... Somebody mentioned a rental car. I think it was Steph or, or may have, of, there was someone mentioned the rental cars earlier. One of the first thing we did was because people were returning their rental cars, but nobody was renting them anymore, was we, we converted a surface lot that was normally public parking into a lot that the rental car agencies could use just for storage. So, um, and also, is there anybody out there from uh, one of the operators like SP Plus or ABM? I was just kind of curious how you were handling it uh, from the contractors, how you were handling your lots and the situation from the contractor side. If you want to speak, you can uh, use the raise your hand feature or you can type into the chat feature and we'll read your question or call you from there. So, well, I'll move on to the next question, which is about um, staffing. A uh, couple staff challenges we've noticed. Uh, I think first and foremost is just keeping the employees engaged with everything going on and with uh, working, re some of the teams working remotely, some having to go to work like Liliana addressed about when you want to be essential or non-essential. Uh, I was just kind of curious about what types of things you were doing to keep the employees engaged, particularly the ones that are uh, still, you know, on site at, at, on the front lines. Cause it seems like it'd be, it's a challenging time to keep people's morale up. So, I mean, I could provide some of the, what we're doing at Houston. Um, so we're, I think, I'm not, I'm not in charge of the, of the I'm, I'm in charge of the whole entire airport, not just the parking site. So I'm just gonna talk for the whole entire airport. So um, our main, our employees, uh, the custodial employees, you know, there are many times when we have the amount of people that we have here that we don't have the ability to be able to close our restrooms or we don't have the ability to be able to deep clean anything. So we're doing is we're, we're using the staff uh, to be able to do just that. The, the projects that we never get to do because we're so busy, those are the projects that we have identified and, and you know, um, because there's a lot of airport to cover, we have the ability to be able to send them to different areas to do that. Uh, we take a lot of pictures and we, we have a, uh, what, what we call connect, uh, which is uh, within the airport system is uh, what we used to be able to communicate. Um, so we take a lot of pictures and we celebrate a lot of what they're doing because it's those projects that we never have a, you know, time to do, the cleaning that we never had a, you know, time to do. So we're, we're doing that and we're celebrating what they're doing. Um, the same thing that we're doing with um, communicating um, on our briefings. We make sure that, you know, they, they feel um, that we appreciate them. We have our executive director uh, do videos just about every other day, um, being great, uh, you know, saying how grateful he is for, for them being here. We're using our, um, the, the advertising within the airport, uh, the CNN um, 
monitors. We're using those to be able to say thank you to the employees. Uh, we have put masks mm -hmm. out. So, I mean, things like that, I mean, things that we usually don't do, providing a lot of refreshments, um, providing a lot of um, um, things that we usually do not do on a very, very, very regular basis. That's what we're doing to be able to keep them engaged. Um, the people that are telecommuting, we have meetings just about every single, we have conference calls just about every, every day. I mean, some of us thought that the work was going to diminish, and I think what it has been all the way around, um, because every other hour we have a COVID conference call for this, for that, or the other. So um, they're, they're, they're keeping engaged for sure, the ones that are telecommuting as well. So that, at least that's what we're doing here in Houston. Yeah, and I get that feeling, like you said, from working from home, it seems like uh, the first day it wasn't so much, but since then it seems like it's just one telemeeting to another telemeeting. Um, so, and someone had a, a comment about spacing cars in the garage. Um, that was Richard Easley. I was wondering if you wanted to expand on that. Yeah. Um, sure, not a problem. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking, I was thinking of those of you that remember September 11th when we, when we had to deal with uh, the, the spacing from um, uh, um, parking spaces to the terminal. So a lot of folks had to close spaces in that concentrated cars in the rest of the parking facility that was there near the terminal. So I got thinking about this, this social distancing and then coming and getting in the cars. And at least here in DC, when you load up in the elevator and there's a bunch of folks trying to get to the, um, <clears throat> to the floor where their car is or getting on the shuttle bus for uh, garage A or B. I got to think, if we got all this capacity, has anyone thought about, and maybe it's cost prohibitive, Anybody thought about, well, let's um, reduce our capacity at the various facilities and have less people concentrated in each parking garage. And so, uh, you know, and, and I, again, that may be cost prohibitive to be able to do that, but, but I just wonder if that came up. That's a great idea. I, did anybody consider that that's on the call? Has anybody talked about that previously? I think that's a great idea. So, well, thank you, sir. Um, so, did did anyone? Uh, I noticed on the asking about if any contractors were out there that uh, Republic sent a, a note, but they said they don't have a mat, mic. But I was wondering, is anybody else out there from say an SP Plus or a ABM or a group like that? wanted to talk about the challenges they might be facing as the contractor. Hey Dave, I'm going to read the comments so every if oh, okay. for the people who are that don't have a video they can they can see what it is. Um, so this is Don from Reef Republic Parking. We are working with our aviation clients to minimize costs and closing valets and other services such as remote lot shuttles in order to conserve costs. Um, we have been reaching out to our clients to work on both the short-term and the long-term plan. Um, the next question I had was, for the, we're not under a shelter-in-place mandate from our governor here in Texas, but I know some areas are. So I was kind of curious how you were handling those with the essential functions if any of your employees had challenges getting to work uh, under those restrictions. Anyone have situation like that? Oh, it uh, looks like we have Eric Haggard. Go ahead, Eric, you're unmuted. Hey, uh, well, I don't work um, for one of the airports, I know in Chicago, despite the fact that there's a, you know, stay at home order, um, the public transit system CTA is still running from what I understand pretty close to a normal schedule. So uh, those people that do, that are considered essential employees can still use the system to get uh, to and from work. That is not the same with the regional train service, but I believe um, a great deal of the 
O'Hare and Midway employees end up using the CTA service and they can still use that to get to work. Okay. Um, Steph in Seattle, are y'all under a stay in place order, shelter in place order? Steph, uh, we're, we are quarantined, well, we're not quarantined, but we're supposed to be um, for 14 days and I believe now we're, it's been extended. Um, so people are just social distancing, like we're not supposed to be you know, out in parks or playgrounds or things like that. Um, we had some issues a week or so ago where people with the first sunny day here in a while and everybody was at the beach. And that's when our governor kind of cracked down. Um, but we're not having any issues with traveling. I mean, you can still get in your car and do your essential items and whatnot, you know, go to the grocery store and pick up things like that. Um, I went to the airport yesterday uh, to pick up a, thing, a few things. Um, and I didn't have any problems getting in. I know our police, we all have letters, um, but um, our police don't plan to check people at entry um, unless they have some sort of traffic violation. So um, I think it's just kind of understood that if you don't need to be there, you don't have to be there. So, yeah. Thanks. And Eric, I forgot to say thanks for your comment, but thank you. Um, did anybody else out there in a, in a shelter in place situation that's run across any challenges with their, um, you know, getting people to and from work or anything? Um, then the next question I have, are you guys, I don't know if anybody's doing it, so I'm asking the question, has it reached a point where people are implementing temperature screenings for their employees? Or I know Liana said earlier, they will be testing the people that came in contact with the gentleman in the operations center, but are, is anybody doing any routine testing or uh, checking temperatures of employees or anything like that? So I know we're not, so, but I thought it was a it was it was just kind of curiosity for me. Um, and I I think around here most people have not really. Most of our customers or our employees have stayed calm, but I was wondering if have anybody has anyone encountered any particular anger in a customer, customer segment, employee, or employee segment? That's good news if nobody has. So. Go ahead, Steph. <laughs> Uh, I know it hasn't been a lot, but we had a number of people who um, are stuck stuck abroad, and they're now concerned about their parking stays uh, and having, you know, an extra 30 days tacked on to their original uh, travel. So, um, you know, some of the things that we've been talking about are whether we're going to provide, you know, overstays. Um, you know, if we're going to take some of that overstay off, or if they're going to be just on the hook to pay for it. Um, but uh, you know, right now, what we're telling customers is if they have someone who can come and get the car for them, but that's not always the case. Um, but we, we definitely have a few um, customers that are not happy about it when they can't get on a plane to come home. And I think Justin has some comments he wanted to read. Yeah, just a, just a few. Um catch up here. Um, Roop from TPA, he said, um, we've also closed our valet and detail services at their facility. Um, Casey Jones um, wrote on here, uh, we heard on other shop talks um, that employees are t uh, undertaking quite a bit of online professional development work coordinated and or offered by their employer. Is that happening with anybody on this call? Yeah, at DFW, we're encouraging our employees to take advantage of some training that we've had available for them, but they haven't had time for. Um, go ahead, Rachel. Thank you. Um, so we have had a number of the shop talks previously, and that is what we're hearing from folks who um, are just trying to give those who are now working from home or need additional resources for hours that um, you know, how can we invest this time well? Um, and 
Uh, so we've definitely done a lot of thinking about how we can help our members in the industry in that regard. Um, so I wanted to let everybody know we've opened up a number of resources, um, free webinars, free courses, um, all kinds of new platforms on forum. Um, we're going to be having a resume exchange that's launched and available for those who have unfortunately or will um, suffer permanent or temporary job loss, as well as essentially an online library of resources. So as you develop, like we know Lily and Seattle, that you guys have been hit first. Philly's certainly hit New York. Um, you know, as you develop resources, things that you could share with people that you have learned, this is a place for you to share those resources with this group, right? Industry specific segment. Um, uh, also just focusing on community. Um, these shop talks have been just, frankly, it warms my heart. I feel so good when I see your faces. I can't even tell you how it means to the staff. Um, we've actually kind of adopted video almost by choice. Almost. <laughs> Um, you know what I mean? Like, so there have been wonderful opportunities to create that community. So, you know, checking out forum, um, sharing your resources with us uh, so we can share them with everybody else. Um, and really, we need to hear what you need from us. Um, and so we're building and, and sort of pivoting is our new favorite word as quickly as we can. And so I encourage you to take a, a look at the link that I sent to everybody and we'll send it out again. So you have a bunch of free training resources that you can offer to your team right away. But we'd love to hear what other people are doing. Um, we heard on our last call that there was a Zoom meeting. Um, one of the universities was having like a lunchtime meeting. It was like 35 total staff. And they 25 of the staff were generally regularly built checking in on the Zoom meeting to kind of do cooking classes and professional development together and just a way to bring people together. Um, thinking about, you know, self-care, mental health, wellness, in addition to our job responsibilities. So interesting things going on. Well, and that seems like a great way to maintain employee engagement while you're in this situation. And, you know, I, I was thinking if this had happened 10 years ago, technologically, we would be much more challenged. Um, but I don't know, I'm grateful to our IT department that, you know, we're able to do things like the Zoom meeting today, or we have other tools we use at work that, you know, weren't available previously. And so, mm -hmm. um, has anyone, has anyone out there had IT type or technological uh, challenges to try to have people work from home or is everybody having pretty good luck with that? Anyone? No. I hear somebody. Yeah. So um, kind of picking backing on what Rachel had said, um, we posted the link. Um, thank you, Sally, for um, posting it for the, the website page for people to visit. Um, you're welcome to, to visit it after our call here today. Um, is there anybody else that, that we haven't heard from or would like to add something that, that hasn't been mentioned? Um, oh, here's a comment from Steph. Um, has IPMI had any conversations about making the CAP test free slash reduced from a training perspective I know my training slash travel budget for the year was completely cut. Um, I have planned to take the CAP exam for this year, but can't now. Justin, I think Kathleen is the best. K Kathleen, can you yeah. unmute yourself there? I know we had discussions about this already, so. Well, I, my screen got a little messed up, um, of course, in the time of need here. So Kathleen, the, the question was, has IPMI had any conversations about making the CAP test free reduced from a training perspective because yeah. training and travel budgets have been cut um, and folks who may have been planning to do their CAP this year now cannot because of the situation? So we do have the CAP scholarship fund, which folks might find useful at this time uh, of need. So I would encourage you if you are thinking about taking the CAP uh, to use the CAP scholarship fund for your professional development. That's what it's here for. Um, 
Uh, we do have um, the virtual conference coming up and if you needed points either for recertification or for the application, the CAP Scholarship Fund will cover both. It's $2,500 for the lifetime limit. So um, the virtual conference, um, it would, it would, you would definitely have leftover monies for that. And you can also use it for your professional development for your points for both the application and recertification. And generally, um, Kathleen, that, that CAP scholarship can be used for travel, right? Usually. Under, <laughs> not this year, but I mean, <laughs> under normal circumstances, it would cover a, a great deal of those expenses. And one of the things that I'm always amazed about is we, I feel like we talk about the CAP scholarship all the time, and a lot of folks just don't know that it exists. And so that's a, it's a wonderful question. But, you know, Justin and Kathleen are terrific resources for you. Um, and, and can certainly make that happen for, for some people this year. Mm -hmm. Casey, you had a comment you wanted to add? Yeah, thanks, Justin. I just wanted to go back to the technology question. Um, you know, I don't work at an airport, but I'm thinking about our workforce and that the lion's share of the people work uh, in, a, in an office in an environment like that. Um, a handful of people work remotely, and so we might have the tools to, you know, to do work remotely, and and for some of us that may be really comfortable. Uh, but it seems to me that you know having the technology and being comfortable with it might be two different things, especially for line staff who who you know are working in the field all the time. So spending some time to understand you know how people are adapting, you know, might actually make them. Uh, you know, feel much more connected and get over the hump and using tools and systems that might be available, but they aren't very um, comfortable with them just yet. Thanks. Um, Good point. I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Casey was saying is that I've had a lot of my personal friends reach out to me because they know that I work remotely 100% of the time. And they're now experiencing how to work remotely versus not working in an office. And it can be a little isolating at times, um, but you know, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're here to answer those questions too. If you know, you've never worked remotely, you know, you have 15 resources at the IPMI um, that work remotely. So <laughs> we're here to answer those questions too. Um, Let's let's go to that. Is there anybody that's working remotely for the first time that is that are maybe having some issues with um, working remotely? Yeah, I can tell you, you know, I I always have issues with working or just in I should, that sounded wrong. I have issues with working. I had so I have issues with working remotely because of uh, we have some um, uh, technology challenges when it comes to an airport. We have so many different things going on at, at a given time. I know that over the last month, it's been amazing to see the um, the people uh, in our IT department, in addition to everybody, um, you know, out in the field. It's amazing to see how everybody's come together and banded together to make this work. And now, I mean, it, it's it's uh, it's pretty easy just to click on a button and I can call whoever I want to call and, and see their face at home. And so, um, it's been very very enlightening to see how um, what we thought just two months ago wasn't really possible. We have the majority of our workforce at home other than the people who are out there serving the customers right now. So it's been, it's been a neat thing to watch. Um, Roop actually added a comment. Um, on the tech question, we are using Microsoft Teams as our platform internally for its messaging and video call capabilities. Um, also, Chuck Reedstrom posted, um, just to build on what uh, Rachel discussed, the CAP Scholarship Fund does cover all travel expenses, including airfare, uh, hotel, meals, and et cetera. Um, I want to add one thing up to that, up to the lifetime limit of the scholarship. Um, so it's not a free reign where you can just, you know, get first class tickets or upgrade to the suite, the hotel. Um, you are limited to the, the total amount of the, uh, the, the scholarship fund. Um, I've just got a few other questions of, that uh, written down. I was curious on the airports, how many of you have a team or 
individuals on your team that are coordinating with the airport itself on the COVID-19 response. I know we have an emergency management team within the, team, the transportation business unit that coordinates, and then the airport has a coordination team. I was just wondering whether what other airports might have that. Okay, not everybody at once now. Uh, how about any of the smaller airports? Like Mike, did, do you guys have any, how, how much do you coordinate with the airport itself on emergency responses? Mike, you're unmuted. Mike? There you go. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, Mike. Okay, sorry, Techn technical difficulties as we're all going through. Um, so I, you know, I can just walk into the director of public safety and um, airport operations office and talk to him. So I, I know exactly how our airport um, is responding. I mean, he, he's in touch with local law enforcement um, and they're getting direction from above and just kind of everything is rolling down the hill um, per se. And we, you know, as a department of Dane County, we, and as I believe it's the second largest county in Wisconsin, are getting, um, you know, advice and direction from the Department of Health Services for Dane County. Um, and we are responding um, to the various sanitization, or sanit I don't know what that word, sanitation needs um, and hygiene that's required. Um, that they're just, they're basically telling us what to do. And, and we have a lot of coordination with the various, um, offices within our local government. Um, and so we're just, we're just, you know, taking it day by day and as things come in, we're just making the changes that, that we, we can. So. Well, our hours are almost up. I really don't have any, um, uh, more questions. Um, does, hey Dave. Yeah. Uh, one question I just wanted to ask is kind of a, um, a strategic question, but for I know I've seen a lot of things where we, uh, a lot of you have closed uh, lots and consolidated and also closed valet and so on. Um, here at DFW, we have um, contracts and we've had to actually uh, cancel one of them because of uh, a couple of lots that we're shutting down. I, I was just curious, is there anybody out there who has had to cancel contracts? Um, and if so, are they planning on the future possibly bringing them back or have they just suspended the contracts or how are they working with contractors to even reduce service um, only to bring it back later on? We don't know if it's going to be a year or two whenever the, the, it comes back, but just for future planning, is anybody, I'm sure you've all thought about what's going to happen in the future, but how are you doing these contracts? Are you canceling them? Are you suspending them? Are you, um, are you just uh, lowering the, the amount of the contract? Does anybody have any, any thoughts on that? What kind of contracts are you talking about, Dean? Like, oh, like contracts to operate the lots for transportation or, you know, just for operating the lots, whether it's uh, taking the cash, credit, so on, um, just the operation of the lot. Yeah, we, we, we haven't, I mean, we haven't here at Houston. I mean, I'm assuming that the, the number of hours that are being given to those employees, especially the shuttle employees, are going to be less. But I think one of the things that we talk about strategically, um, if we let go of those employees, um, it's going to be so hard to start back up again. And especially with the airport, the amount of time that it takes uh, just to bring an employee in and, you know, believe it or not, getting those employees badge is probably the hardest thing. Um, and and the, the, the biggest hurdle that we have as an airport when you're, when you're employing frontline employees. So taking a look at that, I mean, we hope, I mean, pray that, you know, come May, June, we're seeing numbers back up again, not, not to where we were in February or January, but uh, not January, probably uh, November, December. Um, but the problem is going to be how do you, how, you we're not going to be able to employ those, 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 those people back again. And um, the badging of those employees is also going to be a, a difficulty that we have to address and mitigate. 
So that's what we're trying to hold on as, as much as we can to as many employees, whether contractors or, or city uh, aviation employees, as much as possible. Yeah, if you're running, I think you run your facilities there in house or some of them, if I'm correct. But um, a lot of most of it in house. It's in house. Yeah. The parking, the parking, the parking is is contracted out. Okay. Yeah, and I was curious. You know, the contract you can just cancel, and then I hear from you. It sounds like you're just kind of uh, just mitigating it or, or moving people around and do what you can to keep them online until your business comes back. So that I appreciate that. And by the way, thank you. I'm I'm praying for your your folks, the the person who's in the hospital in critical condition. I hope everything is okay and works out. Thank you. I appreciate that. Rachel, do you want to add? Moment? Yeah, I just want to take a moment because I saw that Lily, you have a, a new title. Oh, for taking some time today, despite a big title. I do. I do. I um um, uh, I came back two years to 26 months ago as the general manager for Hobby Airport, and just recently I was promoted to chief terminal manager for both airports. So now I'm I'm in charge of both airports, um, Hobby and Bush. Congratulations. 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 Thank you. Um, want to share, you know, we want to continue to share your good news. We want to share your challenges. We want to share your tears and we are here to do that, but please keep sharing your good news with us too. So, so thank you for making the time to everybody, but um, let us know how we can be there for you. Um, I know Justin has a few closing notes I w and, and I'll, I'll let him, I'll stop talking and let him do his thing. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, I wanna thank everybody who participated today. A special thanks to Dave and Dean for moderating our session. Um, this will conclude today's Shop Talks. I would like to invite everyone to continue the conversation in IPMI's forum at forum.parking-mobility.org. Um, we invite everyone um, to view our other previous Shop Talks um, and we'll have this one up within the next 48 hours. Um, thank you again. Today's Shop Talk is copyrighted in 2020 by the International Parking and Mobility Institute with all rights reserved. You may now disconnect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.